Hallelujah. Well, the Most High be praised. Uh, we're grateful for another opportunity to be able to provide teaching in our School of Messiah Bible Institute class session. We're going to today pick up from where we left off in our subject of water immersion. This is going to be part two of water immersion. And so as we begin, let's open in a word of prayer. Abba Yah, thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to provide teaching to your disciples, your Talmudim. We thank you for your graciousness upon our lives, your mercies and your kindness. We ask that you provide insight and revelation, that you would cause us to understand uh, this topic in its entirety as we cover the second part of this lesson. And may your people who have an open ear and an open heart to receive, may they be enlightened and edified by the teaching. And in all things, may you be credited and glorified. We bless you in the mighty name of Yahshua. Well, the Almighty be praised. Okay, um, we're going to pick up at the uh, third point in the subject of water immersion. This uh, whole section, this is part two. Um, in part one, we covered um, the first point, the second point, which had to do with the origins and development of water immersion in the ancient faith of Israel. And the second point that we covered was water immersion under the ministry of John the Baptist. Also, we um, made mention of the various terms in Hebrew and in Greek that are related to immersion and baptism. In this particular section, what we want to do, we want to cover the concept of baptism or water immersion under the ministry of Yahshua within the Messi or and within the Messianic Israelite community. Let, let me repeat that again. This third section that we're going to cover, section number three that we're going to cover, is entitled Immersion under the ministry of Yahshua the Messiah and within the Messianic Israelite community. So, as we look at this, we are coming now into the ministry of the Messiah, Yahshua. Now, the beginning of the ministry of Yahshua began with Messiah being immersed in water by John, or shall I say the, the uh, John the Baptist uh, was the one who oversaw the baptism of our Messiah, Yahshua. And that is what put forward the baptism of our Messiah is what ushered him into his ministry. So in the ministry of our Messiah, we find that our Messiah was also baptizing or overseeing the baptisms of those who were coming to him. And uh, it's important that we understand that. Um, throughout the scriptures, we find that Yahshua and his disciples are baptizing or overseeing immersions. And our Messiah 
he also gave a mandate to the disciples when he told them to go and to make disciples. And we can look at that. Let's just go to uh, the book of Matthew. Just for clarification, I know that most of us that study the scriptures, we are familiar. But just for clarification, I want to read this just to make the point that our Messiah had instructed for those coming to him to be immersed in water. And rightly so. He himself was immersed in water. So we ought to also be immersed in water. He is our example. But in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you look over also in Mark, if you look over in Mark, the last chapter of Mark, which is chapter 16. We also find our Messiah making a statement in chapter 16, verse 15 of Mark. It says, and he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved. But the one who does not believe will be condemned. So we see here our Messiah giving instruction that disciples that hear the message of the kingdom turn in repentance and believe on him, are to be immersed in water. So we see here that immersion is something that continued under the ministry of the Messiah. We've noted that baptism, wherein Israelites are called to baptism, was an indication that the renewed covenant had now arrived. And we dealt with the, uh, the, the issue how in uh, our last lesson that when people were coming into the faith of Israel, these are in particular converts from the nations, people who are not uh, Hebrews by blood. When they wanted to come to the Elohim of Israel, they had to be immersed in water, which was a sign that they were receiving the covenant. That was an understood concept. With Messiah now um, preaching and teaching, he also is continuing the same process that John the Baptist had started, calling Israelites to be immersed in water. So the idea that the renewed covenant was on the scene was continued by the Messiah as well. And that also was a, a distinguishing mark that Yahshua's ministry, as well as John's ministry, was more than just an itinerant rabbi preaching and teaching and raising up disciples. You had many itinerant rabbis preaching and teaching and raising up disciples in the first century. That was a common thing. But for an itinerant rabbi to call Israelites to immersion meant something. It meant that the renewed covenant was on the scene. It also was an indicator that this person was uh, making claims or indirectly making claims to be the Messiah. 
Because we know that our, our Messiah, Yahshua, while he didn't initially claim to be Mashiach, he definitely uh, made that very clear towards the end of his ministry. So what we need to see about um, baptism within the framework of Yahshua's ministry, it represented that a believer had been immersed into the Messiah. Now we see this idea pointed out by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6, third verse. So let's go to that. Romans chapter 6, the third verse. This is uh, very important here. Because uh, here, where Paul is speaking regarding how we should see ourselves as being dead to sin, Paul introduces the idea of how baptism is associated with our being immersed into the Messiah as well as our dying to sin. So I'm going to begin, actually I'm going to begin from verse 1 of chapter 6 of Romans and then read through to verse 3. And so it says, what then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who are di who who died to sin live go on living in it? Now my mind is my mind is quoting this from King James Version, but I'm reading from a New Revised Standard, so bear with me. I, I do that sometimes because I go in and out of the translations. So I'm going to read verse two again. It says, "By no means, because we're not to continue in sin that grace may abound." He says, "By no means." How can we, who die to sin, or who are dead to sin, go on living in it? Verse 3. Do you not know that all of us, notice what Paul said, do you not know that all of us, so he's including himself, and he is referring to the concept of immersion. Notice what he says. He says, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into the Messiah, Yahshua, were baptized into his death? So he makes the statement and saying is that when a person is immersed, we are immersed into the Messiah. So baptism symbolizes that we have been immersed or placed into the Messiah. We've been dipped into the Messiah. We've been fully submerged into the person of Yahshua. That's what baptism symbolizes. And this idea, it's an ancient idea, because when a person would be immersed in water, it would symbolize that they were being immersed into Elohim. In other words, you're being made one with Elohim. So when we are immersed in the water, it symbolizes that we are immersed into Yahshua. We become one with him. And since we have become one with him, we also are one with him in death. In other words, since the Messiah has died or was crucified and he died for our sins, we, in our dying with him, we also died to sin. So we need to be mindful of how baptism is to be seen and how it is to be understood. It is a symbol that we have been immersed into the Messiah. We've been united with him, made one with him through the immersion. That's what that symbolizes. And it symbolizes that we have also been immersed into his death. So, being immersed into his death says a lot of things. It says that the sinful life has died. The sinful life 
has been buried. The old way of living in sin has been put in the ground, so to speak. So, when we look at how baptism is to be understood within the ministry of the Messiah, and also how it was understood by the Messianic Israelite community, it symbolizes that we are immersed into the Messiah, and it symbolizes that we are immersed into the death of Yahshua. So that's very important. Um, it also represents that a believer has died to the old man and his lifestyle. So we're going to continue to read in uh, verse 4 and also verse 5 and 6. It says, Therefore we have been buried with him by baptism into death. So that just as the Messiah was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So in verse 4, it gives confirming information that water immersion represents that the old life has been buried. It says we have been buried with him by baptism. All right? Verse 5. If we have been united with him in death, like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old man was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. So, another aspect of how Baptism is to be understood is that when we go into the water, it is typified as a watery grave. And our old person, the old man, the old pagan life, the old sinful life, the body of sin, there's a number of descriptions that are given here. That old man, all right? It says that that old man dies with him. So that the new man, the Messiah Yahshua in us, the new man is risen up in newness of life. And we live a new life in him. Another uh, point we need to look at with regard to baptism is the fact that baptism symbolizes that one's sins are washed away. Now, this is a, a concept that I have noticed that some branches of Western Christianity do not want to bring out. Matter of fact, th this verse right here is, is not even mentioned hardly ever. Uh, and, I, and I say that primarily because of my background coming out of a dispensational theological framework. I didn't know it was dispensationalism when I came up in um, the religious systems that I was a part of prior to the Most High bringing me into an Israelite understanding of the Scriptures uh, because my background primarily is from a Baptist and a Pentecostal background. And both of those frameworks held to theology that was based and rooted in the doctrine of dispensationalism. And um, in that thinking, uh, I was taught that baptism was simply an outward expression of an inward grace and that uh, the water has no, no redemptive purposes and, and, and I, I don't believe that the water has any redemptive value but there was no mention of the various symbolisms that baptism had other than an outward work of an inward grace and um, in those particular churches that I was a part of, at least, you know, 
uh, baptism was, wasn't something that when a person came to Messiah, that they were immediately immersed in water. You know, sometimes, you know, that baptism might take about two, three weeks, four weeks maybe, <laughs> sometimes. But uh, the reason for that is because when, when you have an idea that baptism is not really all that important, then the immediacy of immersing a believer in water is not there. So that's, that's the thing I want to bring out. But um, the symbolism, as we've been uh, covering the symbolism of baptism, one of the other symbolisms of baptism or symbols that represents baptism is that it washes away sin. Just as water, when you use water and you cleanse yourself, you wash yourself, um, you know, it is symbolic that your sins have been washed away. So let's, let's go and look at this verse that we're about to look at, that I've been talking about. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Acts chapter 22, verse 16. Okay. So, in Acts chapter 22, verse 16, uh, actually, let, let me go to, uh, let me go to verse, um, 12, because I think it'll make more sense if I read verse 12, because in this portion, um, the Apostle Paul here is um, rehearsing a particular period in his conversion. So let's read. Beginning at the uh, 12th verse of chapter 22 of Acts, it says, a certain Ananias who was a devout man according to the Torah and well spoken of by all the Jews living there, came to me and standing beside me, he said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And that very hour I regained my sight and saw him. Then he said, The Elohim of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will to see the righteous one, and to hear his own voice. For you will be his witness to all the world of what you have seen and heard. And now, why do you delay? Get up, be baptized, and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. So here in this verse, the concept of immersion is associated symbolizing that one's sins are being washed away. And this, this concept was very much so rooted in the Israelite faith because anytime immersions took place, immersions symbolize all of these different things. It represented that a person was being brought into a new life. It, it symbolized the person was being born again. It symbolized that they were washing away their old life, being cleansed from the old and entering into a new. So baptism here, it, it, it has all of this put together because you can't separate the concept of immersion from the concept of purifications. Because purifications was, was another uh, purpose for going into the mikvah, the pool of water for immersion. You had to do a cleansing yourself. So the idea of one's sins being washed away, one's filth being washed away, is also associated with baptism. So I needed to bring that point out as well. And I want to be very clear that it is symbolic. But the scriptures teach us 
that is the blood sacrifice that cleanses. But there are many symbolisms in the Bible about a variety of things. Just as oil symbolizes the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. The oil is not the Spirit, but the oil symbolizes the Spirit. And we're told to anoint people with oil for healing. The oil doesn't heal them. The Holy Spirit does the healing. But we still use the oil. Same with water immersion and what it symbolizes. We need to understand that it is significant. Why? Because our Redeemer told us to do it. Because our Father wants us to do it. When the covenant was first made, which we covered last week, when the covenant was first made through Moses, the Most High said, go tell the people to wash their clothes, which meant that they were to go and immerse themselves in water before they met with Elohim at the mountain, Mount Sinai. So it's important that, that we understand those principles. And based upon what happened then, According to Exodus chapter 19, which is what we covered last Sabbath in the teaching, based upon that, our ancestors continue to use that format for any non-Hebrew that converted to the faith of Israel. They made it so that they would be immersed in water. And so it's important that we understand all of these concepts. All right, now we want to deal with the concept of the baptismal formula question. The baptismal formula question. So uh, where am I going with this? Um, presently, there are different Christian traditions within their framework, where when a person is immersed in water, the officiant, or the overseer of the baptism, makes a declaration. And they will say, when a person is about to be immersed into the water, they will say, I immerse you in, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And another Christian tradition holds to a concept of saying, when a person is immersed in water, I baptize you in Jesus' name. So, these different Christian traditions that uses baptismal formulas believe that their formula is the correct one. Now, one group holds so strongly about their baptismal formula being the correct one that they believe that if the name Jesus or Yahshua is not said, if that name is not said when a person is immersed, that they have not been immersed correctly because the baptismal formula has not been given correctly. So, when we deal with this, um, it's important that we understand, first and foremost, that in the ancient times, there was no baptismal formula. Now, someone is going to immediately say, then why does the Bible say, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? But why does the Bible say baptize them in Jesus' name, like in Acts 2.38 and in many other places in the book of Acts? Why does it say that if there is no baptismal form? And now I need to provide the explanation. When we go back, as we've been discussing, when we go back and look at ancient Hebraic understanding of immersion. When a person came into the water and they were immersed, they were immersed 
by coming in and immersing themselves. No one put their hands on them and put them in the water. And when they came in, they were simply immersed into the water. There was no special pronouncement that had to be made. The immersion itself represented that they were immersed or being placed into the name of the Creator, which meant that they were being unified, made one with the Creator, and that His name was now upon them. By virtue of the fact that they went into the waters, it meant that they were being submerged into the person of who the Creator is, being made one with Him. So that's the concept of it. And His name, Yahuwah's name, was then understood as being attached to that individual. They were attached to His name. So looking at that understanding, we need to go and look at Matthew chapter 28. And I'm going to deal with this by looking at the verse in the Greek. I have an interlinear translation. And anytime I'm teaching this, I like to point this out. Um, some years ago, Roughly, goodness, it's probably been about, about 20 years, 22 years ago, as I was studying the scriptures, and I was looking into the Greek text, I noticed that in the phrase where it says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when I looked into the actual Greek transliteration, it read differently. And I was surprised by that reading. And I want to share that with you because when I read that, a light bulb went on. I understood that there was no baptismal formula. But the immersion itself represented that a person was immersed into the person. That's what it means. But there again, you know, you have those who, who have different perspectives because of certain traditions, ways of doing things. But we need to, there again, look at the text so we can understand it accurately. Because words in the language tell you exactly the meaning and the concept that is to be received. So let's go to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Very important that we get that. All right. So looking at the Greek transliteration, I'm going to read. And it says, going therefore, it says, Disciple all the nations, baptizing them to the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, here in the literal translation, the word in is not there. Now, the Greek word that's there is this word called ice. And it's spelled with three letters. There's the epsilon, the iota, and the sigma. And it's eis. Ice is how you would say it. The word literally means to. And it's translated unto. Anytime you read the King James Version and you see the word unto, like there's a place where it says, that we were baptized unto John's baptism or baptized into Yahshua the Messiah. Like when we read over in Romans chapter 6 verse 3. And it said that as many of us as were baptized into Yahshua, 
for Messiah. We were baptized into his death. The word unto, into is the word ice. It's a term which denotes something going into something else. It's like you take water and you put water into a cup. That's the term ice. Now there's another word, and sometimes ice is translated with the word in, but the meaning of the word ice literally should be into or unto or to because it denotes the thing being placed into another thing. That's the idea. Now there's another word in the Greek where we see translated in the Bible I-N or N like a person will say casting devils out in the name of Yahshua which gives the idea of by the authority of in the name of that word I in in that instance is not the word ice in the Greek it is the word and this, this is interesting but the Greek word is called in in Greek all right? And that word is epsilon nu. In. That's how you would say it. Just like you say in in English, you would say in in Greek. That's a different word. And anytime you see the phrase, I give you power, in my name you shall do this. In my name, you shall do that. That's a different word. That's in. That's not ice. Now, I'm making these distinctions and clarifications so that we'll understand that the word ice is a term that denotes a thing being put into another thing. All right? That's what it means. So, literally, this should be translated... When you baptize, you are baptizing them into the name. Now, the literal translation, at least here, it doesn't give it into. It just says to. Because the, the, the term ice has to do with something being connected to or attached to or placed into something else. That's the idea. I hope you're catching this. And when you read it here from the literal Greek, it preserves the Hebraic concept that when a person is baptized, it symbolizes that an individual is immersed or placed into the name of the Creator. In this instance, it's saying that a person is immersed into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, when you go over into Acts 2.38, and it says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yahshua the Messiah. That word is also ice, not in, in the Greek. It is ice, which means that a person is immersed into the name. Now, the people who heard this in the original Hebrew, now they were speaking Hebrew, not Greek, when they were speaking it, they understood exactly what it meant. What they were being told was that you're going to get immersed in water and your baptism is symbolizing that you're being placed into the name of Elohim and Yahshua. You're being placed into his name. They did not have baptismal formulas during that time. There was no baptismal formula that they fought over. They were not saying, well, you got you to gotta say in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Or you got to say in the name of Jesus or in the name of Yahshua. They wasn't. They were not 
concerning themselves with those types of semantics. That was not a concern to them at all because there was no baptismal formula. Now I, 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 I get I get a little excited when um when I talk about this because with understanding Hebraic thought and with understanding how the first century apostles uh, carried out baptism, it really breaks my heart to see how in our day different Christian traditions fight over, bicker over, and, and literally look at other believers as though they are not saved over issues that in on both sides there's inaccurate understanding with regard to the whole idea of a baptismal formula. But you see, unless unless mores or teachers like myself take the time to look into the original text and associate what the text is saying with the Hebraic culture of what was practiced, then we miss it. This is why it's so very important and very essential that in all of our teaching and studies on all subjects, we must understand them Hebraically. Very important. The thing that, uh, that I've noticed over the past 30 years of, of being in the ministry, teaching, preaching, pastoring, and, and, and doing the things that, that I've done. I've been preaching since I was 15. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm 53 now. What, I, what, I, what I've discovered is that Bible teachers and, and, and pastors and preachers, when there's a subject that they want to really get across, that's when they take the time to, as you know, many do, go into the Greek, bring out the Greek words, and, and, and then present it to the people. Because most of the time is in what, what, what is the so-called New Testament scriptures. I call them the writings of the apostles. And, and what happens is, because there is not a consistent pattern of teaching the scriptures from the original text, from the Hebraic perspective. So you can go into the Greek, but yet still not really convey the scriptures as accurately as possible because what is missing in the teaching of the scriptures is that if you do not take into consideration that when you are teaching the Bible in the writings of the apostles, even though you are looking at a Greek document, that Greek document preserves Hebraic thought and Hebraic culture. All right? That Greek language wears Hebrew clothes because the people who wrote the scriptures in the Greek language were Hebraic thinking, Hebraic living people. So you cannot go into this Bible come up with Greek definitions from a Greek culture perspective and then impose them. You must understand that when you look at the Greek language, you have to find the equivalent Hebrew term and then put it all together from the Hebrew culture perspective. But here, when we look at this word that's presented here in the Greek, it tells us, oh, it's ice, it's two, you baptize them too. You, the baptism means that the thing that's being immersed, it's being immersed into something. It has nothing to do with a verbal declaration. The Messiah didn't say that when you baptize them, then you are to say, I baptize you into the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He didn't say that. 
He said, you immerse them into the name. That's what he said. It has nothing to do with a verbal declaration. So all of us who come from these backgrounds, where we've been told that you got to say this over somebody or they're not baptized right. The most high can care less about what verbal baptismal formula that you use. It doesn't matter to him because he didn't say use a baptismal formula. It's not here in the scripture. Now, for those who may disagree with that, then that's fine. You can do that. What you're doing is you're disagreeing with what the text is conveying. I'm just conveying the text. You know, when you discover what the text conveys, you, you need to adapt to it. You know, someone once said, when you know better, do better. Problem is that most in the Christian churches, when they learn something to know better, they want to continue with their tradition that's, that they've held on to for however many hundreds of years. But we need to do better. And the Most High is going to hold us accountable for our lack thereof of dispensing truth accurately. When you do not dispense truth accurately, it breeds confusion. And this is, there again, here's an example of it. So, <clears throat> there is no baptismal formula. All right? It's important that we understand that. Uh, many passages in the scriptures, as I mentioned, where it talks about being baptized, it's the term ice is the term that is used in every instance. You can look it up and find it in Acts chapter 2, 38, Acts chapter 8, 16, Acts chapter 10, 48, Acts chapter 19, 5. Also in a place like, in those passages that I just read, those are examples where it says being baptized in the name of Jesus or Yahshua. All of those passages I just read. It should say you're baptized into the name Yahshua. Also, in Romans 6, 3, which I already mentioned, where it says being baptized into Yahshua, that's also ice, as I mentioned. So those scriptures are examples of where the term ice is used. All right? Now, <clears throat> what I want to do is look at methods of water immersion. Methods of water immersion. And this part is going to wrap up our teaching. So, um, we know that the ancient literal method of water immersion is by complete submersion into the water. That can be a stream, a pool, a lake, where a person comes in and is fully submerged. Now, when there were situations where there was no body of water for a person to be immersed, there were other methods that were used. And these were alternative methods, if I can use that term. These alternative methods were used because there was no body of water around in order for a person to be completely submerged in. And as a result of that, the alternative method would be that of sprinkling. This is where the concept of sprinkling came. Where someone would take some water and they would sprinkle it over a person. Now sprinkling was not the way or the manner in which baptism was to occur. Baptism is baptism. Immersion is immersion. A person being submerged in water. But in instances where there wasn't any water, and a person received the Messiah, turned in repentance and faith, then they used whatever water they had available, and they would sprinkle it on them. The other method was also 
pouring water. And that was also due to the fact of not having the ability to fully submerge someone in water. You have these alternative methods that develop, either sprinkling or pouring. So these methods were developed as a makeshift way for a person to receive baptism. Now, we find that there are Christian traditions today that because they don't wish to use full body submersion, and of course, that whole idea developed a couple hundred years downstream, primarily used by those who are non-Hebraic in their practices and wanted to basically have a way of performing baptism that was convenient. You know, we find this whole idea of convenience really, really um, <laughs> being seen in the non-Hebraic churches. You know, let, you know let, let's find an easier way to do this. It's, it's easier. You know, it, it's more efficient. Well, the concept of immersion is to be fully submerged into the water. However, originally, these other methods, such as sprinkling and pouring, those were methods that were used because there was no, not enough water for a person to be completely submerged. And that's the basis. And I would recommend if you're ever in a situation where you're somewhere and there's no ability to completely submerge someone in water, then by all means, pour water on them. Sprinkle them. However, in the era in which we live today with the great urban cities and hotels and pools everywhere, <laughs> it's not hard to find a place to completely submerge someone in water. So in our time, there's really no excuse for it. But these other methods of immersion, they were developed because of not having a place to be able to completely submerge someone in water. And so we want to close on that note with the subject of water baptism. Let us pray. Avinu McCain, our Father, our King, thank you. Thank you for this time of teaching. I trust that the subject has been beneficial to all of your Talmudim. I trust that it has helped and encouraged them and it has provided enlightenment and illumination to be able to understand the topic accurately. And Abiyya, it's my desire that in hopes that as your Talmudim understand the subject, that they would be able to teach others that would shed greater light to others that have a concept from other Christian traditions that may help to bring shalom among the differences that presently exist on this topic. But may your great name be praised in all things, and we will bless you in the mighty name of Yahshua. Well, for those who are watching us by live stream, we appreciate those of you who have chosen to attend and be a part of this class session. We definitely would encourage you to enroll in School of Messiah Bible Institute. You can go to our website at www.ncmmi.20m.com, excuse me, and you can click on the link School of Messiah Bible Institute and download an application for admission 
We definitely would love for you to enroll and be a part of the school. And for those of you who may be watching for the first time, we want to say thank you. We trust that this teaching has been helpful to you and that you have learned something that you didn't know before. And we also encourage you that are watching to share in giving a donation to this ministry. It helps us to continue to bring the word of Elohim to the nations while at the same time training Talmudim, training disciples for ministry and doing that that the Most High has mandated us to do. We thank you in advance for your support because your support helps us to be a blessing to the needy and continue the work of the kingdom. You can also donate um, from our website www.ncmmi.20m.com You can do it by clicking the donate button or by cash app with our code dollar sign NCMMI. Bless the Most High Yahuwah. Thank you again for tuning in. We trust that we have been a blessing to you. Most of all, pray for us that we may continue to be a viable voice of the Almighty to the nations. Be blessed. Shalom.